Welcome to Restroom, the second in a series of four conversations. Restroom is part of Recover, chapter one of Rest of the Struggle, unfolding at Spiel Art Festival 2021. My name is Malika. Today we speak with Neil Chowdhury and Bindu Malini Narayan Swami, whose voices you have been listening to in morning broadcast in the morning and here for you at night. This will be a dark room. Our voices will be reaching you. Our videos will be off. We will chat for about an hour. The chat box is open for you to speak to each other and to speak to us. If you haven't already signed up for Morning Broadcast and here for you, do so by the links given in the chat box here. You won't regret it, I promise. Welcome, Neil and Bindu. How are you? Hi, Malika. I've been good. I have been... Uh, quite busy in fact so looking forward to this this next one hour of resting on the idea of rest it was really quiet here just till about five minutes ago just till this talk started and then suddenly as if on cue there's a bunch of ambulances that went by Sorry, the that's not a response. <laughs> but the ambulance is really like the sound of the century. Yeah. And construction. Yeah. Also. I've been listening to you both morning and night. And I was wondering... Uh, how you guys were feeling. It's a week since you have been present to recover. I've been talking to this, uh, with talking about this with a bunch of people and including the people who are working for rest of the struggle. And um, this there's a strange irony in making work that is seeking to, I don't know, represent a sense of rest or a, a conversation about rest and thinking about rest and not quite being in a restful state while making the work. While, um, I mean, for me, the past week has been very frenetic. I had a sense of how I was going to make this broadcast and be always a few steps ahead. And then it just began. And there was something about the momentum and velocity of it that kind of has really sort of swallowed me up. But the thing that I wanted to say is um, f for multiple reasons, most of which are my own making, the experience of making the broadcast is strenuous. But the moment that I uh, put it out there, that that singular moment the, that it kind of goes up on the Telegram channel is a moment of immense relief and rest every day. Every day I just kind of sort of collapse into a sense of, um, a really nice sense of lethargy. I know lethargy is a very negative word that we use, but I, 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 I kind of really sort of release everything that I'm thinking and feeling at that moment. We just finished a session with Surabhi Theatre right now. And in speaking with them about rest and re recovery previously, they said something similar, which is the rest uh, the release, what you say, 
uh, that comes after finishing a show, after striking down that entire big set that they put up. You know, they mm. finish the show, they strike it down. And the sense of rest that comes after that is bigger than any other rest that we otherwise think about, you know, uh, that state of idleness or a state of doing nothing. Um, for me, actually, when I started here for you uh, during the second wave, um, it was not just about music or silence, but it was really a space for my own self to go into without um, with a lot of gratitude that I have this one more day to savor. And it was very, very real at that time when, you know, we were really losing a lot of loved ones. And to go in there with a lot of earnestness of saying, I want to do something life affirming. To center myself and to the people who came into that space. So the sense of time and sense of deadline or commitment had a very different color during that time. And it did liberate me from the from the stress of a tomorrow. And now when I'm doing the same back um, during this festival, I can see that I'm, I am making sure I float into that space, uh, which I may not have been able to tap into if I had not done it so consistently for 90 days, you know, because I think it is a practice of entering into a state and trusting that state and space of um, truly feeling that here and now which I, it's like this whole thing of it here and now is very difficult for me my mind just flies in thousand different directions <laughs> in less than you know a bat of an eyelid but really to play with it and be very confident about knowing that it's about savoring this moment um, did come from that and that if that floating is the resting is, is an aspect of rest then I would say I do feel very rested um, entering into the space of here for you um, and the way my technical support team also holds it it's it's very light and loving and which makes it even more beautiful i'm very envious <laughs> sorry sorry Bin. no i hear a dog barking <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'm i'm very envious of this um this state of floating uh, i mean i think that it I f it's something that i recognize but i also find extremely elusive in the theater and i was thinking today about um is the process of making morning broadcast and the sort of tension that i feel in the moments in the build up towards the release of an ep episode is it any different from what it has felt like to make theater and to you know run up to a series of shows mm. and i think my um there's this experience that I have of uh, a deep, deep um, unrest and vulnerability. Uh, and it comes from the fact, from the infrequency of, uh, of, of performing in the theater. I mean, even uh, at the best of times, uh, you, you spend much, much less time on stage in, in the kind of theater context that I work in than you do in rehearsal. And rehearsal is an extremely uh, restful place for me. I, I think that the theater rehearsal room is one place where I, I feel both physically, emotionally, and uh, to some extent, even spiritually, very, very at ease. And the moment one 
moves into the theater space, I've noticed that even in projects that I'm feeling very secure about, even projects where I feel like, oh, yes, we have arrived at something very interesting and I, I have a confidence that the audience will respond to it. The, the sense, the immediate run up to a show is always so uh, nerve wracking for me. And th this thing that you talk about does occur now and then where the show begins and then you suddenly are able to sense the presence of the audience and their attention. Mm. Mm. And then it's just, you know, you just, you're, yeah, you're floating, you're floating above everybody and you've, uh, you're away from uh, your own language and your own uh, creativity. You're like uh, almost interloping in the space then. You're, you're not even uh, present as a participant sometimes. And um, that is very restful. That's, it almost, it, it almost, I mean, in, in a, in a kind of awful wordplay on, on your, on your project, it's almost that you're not here, <laughs> you know, uh, and I, I, yeah. I love that state. I, I yeah. really, I enjoy that state very much. Hmm. Um, Neil, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that we both have been um, engaging both morning broadcast and here for you is all about just the voice and sound. Mm. And uh, the absence of visual. I think it's for me, it really opens up a lot of other things. At the same time, it also heightens my sensitivity to sound and one of your, I think your third episode was on silence. Mm. And it was remarkable. And you were sp speaking about the silences that we, you know, we as a nation or a, or a community, we are asked to have that one minute of silence when something has happened or something, somebody has passed on. You yeah. spoke about that, that the question that you brought up there of who do we keep the silence for? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, um, I can remember in school, in the assembly line, we, mm. we will keep that silence. And sometimes I don't even know who I'm being silent for. Like, I'm like, okay, somebody died. Who was that now? Okay, how am I supposed to now? feel bad <laughs> i don't know you know and i don't even know who that person is and then i will be like okay am i just holding silence for the loss that somebody else is feeling or the idea of death or what is it and what am i supposed to think at that time you, when you brought up brought that question all this was running in my head and are we done with um Uh, is that one minute of silence enough? Is that question? You, you know, um, it's funny that you ask this. One of the things that I wanted to do in that episode, which I didn't, because I thought it was, it might turn out to seem a bit gimmicky, hmm. was that to end the episode in this slightly sort of John KG way of holding a minute of silence for a minute of silence, you know? Hmm. Um, and it just didn't arrive at that point. And I would have had to force it in. And then it would have seemed like, you know, just didn't belong there. But I, I think a lot about this, uh, Bindu Malni. I think a lot about uh, silence because I feel like there is this paradoxical relationship that we have with it. At one level, we give it such importance in that context, in the context of a minute of silence and silence in libraries and silence in museums and silence in silence in places of worship. You know, it, we kind of revere silence in a way. It's, um, it's something that immediately uh, um, speaks of a culture of uh, calm and a culture of seriousness and everybody kind of uh, occupying space together. But at the mm -hmm. same time, it also 
but the paradox is i think it terrifies us i mean i think that um the moment we become conscious of silence uh, it also f- uh, frightens us because it feels to people that something is missing or something is absent or something has been controlled and i think that um i think that that contradiction is very present in at least the culture in in which we live in and yet uh so many of us spend a lot of time uh in silence and that's a silence that we're not conscious of and that's the silence that we occupy when we're alone uh unless you're talking to yourself i mean but i mean generally when we're alone the silence that we occupy uh and because we're not conscious of it i think at that time perhaps we don't give it weight and um yeah i've rambled on i don't know uh, <laughs> no, where right, i began right. but no no it's interesting because um when you when i was he- listening to you speak um the idea of sound and safety i think it's a very primordial thing for us even yeah. in the jungle when uh if a predator is going to come everything goes silent that's a big sign that there is i i mean danger is a very loose word something is lurking there and uh, in fact if i remember i sleep very peacefully when there's a lot of chatter around when my family has gathered and everybody is like yapping about i go to sleep amidst that very peacefully um mm. also in um movie theaters the loudest of <laughs> fights and songs <laughs> i yeah. get same. my deepest <laughs> sleep same same <laughs> <laughs> and um yeah so that that silence and sound has that thing also of uh, feeling safe and that that fear um is there and the held silence also is a very um, i don't like angry silence um also mm and there was one more question which was there in my head today which was the idea of rest um mm-hmm. i'm not trying to overrate rest but at the same time i feel it's been very 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 um underrated especially in our country the whole concept in our relationship and imagine this big notion or this um tag we carry with ourselves of being in a developing country mm mm you know the whole idea of rest how does it resonate with us when we very strongly it's been embedded in us that we are in a developing country mm-hmm. and w- how will that change if we feel okay we are developed or i mean there is no developing you know that that continuous thing of that really sets something in motion and yeah i yeah yeah no i hear you i mean i also feel that with rest um it almost is uh i mean the two things i'm thinking of is one that it's all rest is always seen in relative terms to something else uh mm-hmm. often labor and work so mm-hmm. rest is the thing that must happen uh you know after or before uh uh or or punctuating uh work um and and also to this aspect of us being a developing country developing culture uh which again is a relative definition right yeah. developing like in relation to what yeah. uh and in that context rest is also seen as uh in a commodified form i feel right so like uh, a lot of um, um a lot of sort of practices stretching all the way from yoga and meditation 
to uh, speak purely in terms of in terms of sound cultures there's now this whole culture of um the kinds of sounds that you can listen to for rest whether it's ambient soundscapes or you know sounds of white noise or sounds of the sea or or kind of lulling uh stories uh and and i think that that's again it's made it uh, it's made it a commodity in the sense that i have to get rest i have to i have to schedule rest and i don't i mean again i don't want to overrate it as you say but i don't see like um how does one uh how does one get out of this cycle um i'm one side I'm not, i have uh, doubts about that yeah, the one sorry. one side is the commodification of it in in a way but the other is to say um for me it's like rest almost equates to guilt mm. you know and um that's a huge price we all are paying and uh, it's it's luxury sometimes you have to earn your rest and you know it's not a it's not a right it's not a basic fundamental right almost but that rest that is earned is also you know a vacation on which then you have to do so many things because you have to see this and you have to see that and you have to visit this and you visit that and, and that is also work and it's not really rest i my mind goes to um, summer holidays when i was a child uh, those were times where we did not have as much digital stimulus as we have today uh two channels on television that came up only at 7 pm or 6 pm or something like that the rest of the time the television was white noise and that time we were what did we do in summer holidays i think i am listening to neil talk right now all this you can listen to ocean sound you can listen to this sound we didn't have all of this so did people not rest when they did not have the apps that made them rest and all we all i remember doing is staring at the ceiling looking at the fan going around and around and around and daydreaming there was not very much else to do i also have two um questions the first is that i feel like often we define rest as the absence of um uh, physical acti- activity mm. Mm. and mm. um yesterday's episode of morning broadcast i went kind of searching for sounds of rest and i couldn't find i mean something about the technicality of the search engine made it the the word rest wasn't showing up also nobody really records sounds of rest i think um but i i listened to a number of uh, a number of sound recordings that made me feel that i was listening to kinds of rest so whether it was sort of factory workers in colombia playing table tennis you know or um, the fishermen in kovalam singing on their way back to shore i felt like um, there is rest in activity that isn't being seen as rest that is being seen as some ritual something that people do but it isn't they may not clearly define it as rest but perhaps it is restful and so i think that maybe one of the problems is that we and 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 a source for this guilt is that um we get into a space we define rest as not doing anything and then when we're not doing anything we feel uh, that that guilt so that's the first kind of uh, so quandary that i have is that uh, how how can we see rest as activity and not as uh the absence of it and the second is you know uh, and malika and i were talking about this earlier but what you said bindu malini about where this you know where does this guilt come from like what has defined it and who is responsible for it outside of ourselves i i'm really confused about this because you know we can say oh it's the structure of work culture it's uh 
it's the capitalist mode that kind of the world is in it's um, it's the you know government who you can almost blame for anything um but i mean what is our um, how are we complicit in this culture of not resting ourselves i mean i think that uh, we ex- we externalize the possibility of rest that i can rest when people allow me or when i have the ability to rest but can we not also really sort of demand it of, of ourselves i mean it, i mean that's what again the the commodification of rest does that a lot it says you have to take this for yourself but again we are we are doing it because somebody else is telling us to uh so i have these two sort of questions and uh, doubts about uh how in some senses maybe self victimization when it comes to this hmm now tej uh, hmm yeah yeah sukha yeah because yeah, yeah, i was neil, thinking of that yeah yeah because yeah, yeah. neil used the word demand and i think uh, this has been uh, the biggest uh, revelation for me to say that okay we can demand rest repose and pleasure but in that way neil is absolutely right it is a demand that comes from within and not from outside true and uh, i think for me in the last two years um it's been so uh, it's been such a beautiful opportunity or a chance to relook at your own breath your own uh if not pushed or pulled what is the pace in which you kind of go about mm. and if that pace doesn't feel like you're either hurrying or trying to resist something i feel that's a continuum of um both activity and rest which is something like sukha that um suk sorry not sukha suk that uh, navteej was also probably talking about and um at that time i don't think time really matters then um mm. Mm. we kind of f- free out, out of that uh so in a way i have changed the pace in which i work now and uh, trying to be more conscious of trying to build practices to um acknowledge a different way of working which might make it a lot more enjoyable for me mhm um but going back to the guilt part you're very right it's also within us but i was also talking about a collective consciousness where we the kind of um like how you know every moment had to be accounted for in my growing up days um there mm. has to be a purpose there has to be a meaning to every mm. uh, and uh, like i was saying rest is rust was something which was kind of um indoctrinated in a way so to then say oh maybe not is where i'm saying uh if i'm carrying a guilt or i have to work my way out of a guilt it's also because of this i'm not um and i don't think it's just a one off thing what i am mm. talking about is something where um it has its um, its pa- its place also uh i mean i'm 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 not saying that was wrong and i'm right or nothing like that it's just that there's also this need of the hour where mm. if you probably didn't work hard enough you really couldn't make ends meet that's the reality yeah i'm i'm uh, extremely moved by this idea of that you were talking about uh about trying to change the pace um of how you live and work i think that's something i really want to do very much i i would say it's something that i'm 
not being quite as successful at at the moment um but i had experiences of it i think um during the lockdown uh when they really either there wasn't work or there wasn't the energy to do work and again it it's something that sort of permeated into a kind of uh, collective consciousness because for example there are a couple of projects that i worked on there where i was taking a lot of time i mean there's there are projects that began in the lockdown that i'm still working on and are still taking a lot of time and i often would then approach collaborators people who've commissioned the work people who i'm uh in some ways answerable to and uh most of the time i seem to recall being met with a great amount of empathy and not from a place of oh i understand you're going through something but uh also because i think those people have experienced that same thing um but just to take it away from the personal into the slightly more uh, abstract sort of artistic space uh another thing that i did early on in the lockdown and this was incidental but then i was listening to a lot of uh music by glen gould the canadian pianist and he has these two uh landmark recordings of bach's uh goldberg variations one of them was at the beginning of his career and it's this virtuous virtuous of sort of performance at such like great sort of speed and um and it really made his career he became this sort of young genius pianist and then uh i think maybe about 30 years later he recorded another version of the goldberg variations much more tempered much slower and uh, uh and this is just before he passed away and in kind of listening to it and then sort of reading about you know how come what happened and a lot of people talk about this idea of the discovery of slowness and his discovery of slowness mm. and that moved me so much because then every time i listen to the second version now which i infinitely prefer uh the it's sort of tinged with this sense of uh, an artist who has kind of suddenly realized uh the significance of the time between notes you know and the moments uh, uh and that he can take his time you know uh and it um, the first aria when it begins i have the sensation of um, deep longing for that um to be able to kind of embrace that not just artistically but you know to be okay to just take time and to not kind of uh, convince yourself that everything in the world is uh, premeditated on 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 speed and efficiency yeah in a way um somewhere the attraction from carnatic to hindustani was mm. also in the idea of the tehrav mm. did i love it right tehrav yeah, yeah beautiful lovely to really you know just um land and be in one place or come to that place with eternity you know and just flow i think it was really intoxicating for me um and uh, it's so potent the tehrav is is so full and it's not empty or absent mhm uh when i had to do my resting notes literally i was playing with the word of resting notes and this is what tehrav came to my mind and uh, to savor it what when i heard you talk about uh, these two pieces 
that's what came in my into my head of really relishing and mm-hmm. sort of stretching that moment for as long as you can um yeah to kind of flirt with that moment and see if you can get a little more out of it by just stretching that moment then packing it with things yes but this tehrav uh, comes with a lot of work work or life lessons maybe uh, possibly Real. possibly <laughs> yeah you have nowhere to go where are you running anyway kind of a thing i, I mean tehra uh, even in um, even in performance which uh, that moment of suspension i i think even alpit speaks about this in when he's conducting his sessions but even in the even on stage i think it's a um, it's evasive mm. but when it arrives it's very juicy it's very uh, full of ras tehra Hmm. Ab- about a little over 10 years ago uh, Bindu Malini um Malika and I were both uh, involved in a uh, theater production uh, called Tara Mandal and it's a play mm-hmm. in which we had experimented with the silence that occurs between people a lot you know uh, and we would really push it uh, sometimes to like the frustration of even the actors themselves sometimes that but we were really trying to test like how can how much can we explore of this pause and this silence and i remember a show we did in chennai uh, for the metro plus festival the hindu festival mm. uh, and after the show the festival uh, invites the audiences um, to review the play and they publish it in the newspaper the ne- next day or two days later is little sort of uh, uh paragraphs of audience citizen reviews they call it and when we were reading the reviews which were all really warm very uh uh generous every review had one common line which was the pauses were too long um and it kind of made me think again to come back to something i said earlier that people sometimes even uh in their daily lives and even with uh, uh art or storytelling don't know to what to do with silence anymore i mean i think uh i think people get nervous about it because so much of the audiovisual culture around us doesn't employ silence silence is seen as a waste of uh kind of space. seconds yeah space yeah mm. yeah um i got i was already thinking about the silences in the here for you <laughs> that's where i got the <laughs> even drifting <laughs> it's interesting mm. because in here for you uh, actually there are there is silence right at the end but through it i find there to be a lot of silence or perhaps i'm looking for the word quiet um even in the tanpura hmm yeah somewhere the tanpura um becomes like a curtain of quiet mm. to remind you of that quiet actually than emptiness it's it's a sustained heartbeat of that's how i use it like a curtain uh maybe like neil said the complete absence of sound is probably a little too unnerving i should mm-hmm. work on that and see how that feels um yeah. how are, how how are you guys sleeping are mm. you sleeping at all 
insufficiently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So somehow for me in the last few days um or it's been like that for some time now where I do not go to bed early although I want to but I never achieve it but I'm I have a very disciplined and dedicated practice very early in the morning which I show up for so I don't want to miss out on that so I have to get out of my bed by latest 5:45 um and somehow through the day suddenly at least one or two waves of fatigue or that deep sleep hits me but i try to fight it so that i'll be like okay today i think i'll just hit the pillow and i'll be like woof gone but no uh there are various <laughs> factors to it um some seems to be my own biorhythm but uh, i have a very active neighborhood of different orchestrated uh dog concerts <laughs> going on <laughs> throughout the night so <laughs> now i have started making different different recordings when i say okay and i i have a nice 30 minute recording also non stop <laughs> wow that's long yeah, yeah. Mm. and that's just a snippet of an entire mm. night so um, but like i was telling malika that ever since she started we started having this conversation about rest um somehow i was like oh my god i do deserve rest mm. and that um i can ask or try and create a conducive environment as much as i can for my peaceful sleep and why not and why can't each, each of us be kind of sensitive to the other and why is that taken for granted a lot in our culture like for example if somebody is sleeping in the house during the day how many times are we conscious of oh that person is sleeping can we do everything in a little more silent way mm, there are many times which i when that has not happened mm. Mm. i have a counter perspective to yours uh, bindu malni on dogs mm. Uh, mm. i mean i uh, i also live in a colony with some very noisy dogs Mm. but i also live with a dog and well i do too i have two <laughs> so yeah. i'm not no 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 i'm <laughs> yeah no no the 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 thing that i was going to say and this is also in response to malika's question about how have you been sleeping and the past 3 mm. days mm-hmm. um i've had very little sleep uh, and this is nobody's fault but my own but you know it's 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 not something that i can blame something external for not even the construction that's happening at next door which i go on and on about but actually the truth is i would probably be able to sleep through it um but during the day in these last 3 days i keep turning to find uh, my dog bundle is her name uh sort of um uh, in this in her most favorite sleeping position which is this uh, kind of like uh she it's a bit like uroboros the snake you know who's eating its own tail like she's kind mm. of curled into curled up mm. a layer and i take such uh, vicarious joy from the image and sometimes you know i just have to lie next to her for 30 seconds because um it's just uh, her commitment to it i mean she has not much else to do i mean uh, but her commitment <laughs> her commitment to it um in that moment is uh it is her right you know and it is uh it is her state of being at many points in the day and mm. um i find uh beholding that very restful uh 
I sometimes feel envy, but mostly <laughs> I feel a uh, a kind of a, a loving sense of gratefulness that that she has it, and I want it for her. I want it for myself, but I also want it for her, mm. and mm. she has it. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's true that uh, the conversation or a narrative or to be able to even speak about rest is because one is privileged and that um, one person's or rather that there are many who must struggle in order to some in order to have some who can rest and i think um, one is not unaware of this and i think when we are looking at um, um, the multitude that for example the doll making sessions are holding in terms of artists their backgrounds uh, their contexts their idea of rest and recovery it really brings the multiplicity of entry points into this topic into sharp relief there are many privileges that we are battling right now within this particular room itself language access of so many kinds and yet i'd like to imagine that rest is really truly meant for every body in spite of knowing that every body does not have it perhaps cannot have it yeah i i, I agree uh, and i see this this point and the things that uh, malika as you say it brings into relief but i also feel something uh, about how we define rest for ourselves and i think that this this thing that i was talking about earlier that um people with privilege before because they can tend to separate the idea of rest from work and activity because they have that privilege um but in certain contexts because that privilege doesn't exist the idea of rest is uh has to be embedded into a more uh daily uh culture and and habit and experience of living uh and i have seen uh that occur and people kind of live that uh very successfully for example um recently uh i i've been shooting a, a documentary in various parts of the country mainly interviewing farmers and the one common thing to the farming community that i have spoken to uh, across uttarakhand and bengal and orissa and maharashtra and rajasthan is the way that they spoke about the time of the lockdown as being a time of almost quite like a uh, joyful serenity for them uh almost in a way of kind of uh uh sort of gently mocking us city people who had come there and were asking them you know so how did you manage and you know and, and because for them uh the there's a sense of safety and security because of their lifestyle that that has kind of embedded itself into uh the way they are and so at least these communities and i don't want to generalize uh are very restful in their culture of farming and in their uh their ability to uh find rest while they're in the fields or find rest through uh songs for example the women in uttarakhand are almost always singing when they're farming mm. um and um and you know it's it sometimes uh, the other sort of privilege and vantage point of being coming from the city and coming from you know a certain class background is that you kind of again 
have that sense of judgment that oh this is not a very restful life uh mm. but they don't agree i mean they uh to them rest is perhaps embedded in the daily culture of how they live and uh, in a more uh harmonious way than we are able to manage in the cities for sure yeah definitely i mean the the whole sense of rhythm and the habit uh and seasons it's so much more beautifully um built in there Mm. and uh, of course we all have four more to add to this we're almost at time um do you have any final comments to make i just am looking at the chat box are you guys looking at it Hmm. <laughs> I like this image of the women in the village in Uttarakhand rebelling and chatting happily. Hmm. I'm very uh, said sorry. Hmm. You had said yeah. Neil to take time has become uh difficult now and that perhaps to take time to do things is uh, is a matter of rest yeah i think so and i think there's um there's a risk that you have to take that uh that you have that demand for yourself and then inevitably that demand has to be of other people as well so whether it's work or whether it's daily rituals and you know um if that becomes a a, a kind of demand that you make for yourself and a practice mm-hmm. for yourself mm-hmm. then it's something that has to get embedded in into the way that you work with people or the, the way that people work with you rather i mean you mm-hmm. always we always sublimate ourselves to the larger bodies that we belong to you know the social mm-hmm. circles the work culture the office the the um, uh even even the artistic communities that we occupy i mean bidu malini was talking about this fear of missing out and that mm-hmm. too is kind of you know this pressure to show up to be present to be seen to be available you know um i think that the maybe the first step is to uh be okay about not mm. being present all the time available all the time It's one, yeah, I just wanted to say one more thing, which is unrelated, but it's a, it's in it's it's by way of thanks to both you, Malika, and and Bindu Balni, uh, because the idea of being involved in a singularly sort of audio project, I've been trying to do it for years, and it never really happens, and that's partly because I just haven't kind of pushed myself in that direction, but also because we we live in what I believe is really. quite a visually chauvinistic culture where like you know uh with the 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 image demands and occupies more space and to be part of a project and uh that is just about listening is also very restful for me restful for the eyes more than anything else because uh yeah i just i feel like that's something that that i i need uh at this moment to not always be looking 
and watching and uh, listening more. Thank you. And thank you, Neil and Bindu Malini for having this really wonderful conversation without the chauvinism of the visual. <laughs> um, for those of us who are here, thank you very much for joining. Um, this conversation will be uploaded later on the Spielat YouTube and will be also available on the Spielat website. Please feel free to listen to it again, share it with friends, families, and perhaps even enemies because everyone needs a dose of rest. In about 30 minutes, Bindu Malini will be singing for 15 odd minutes. If you haven't been present at Here For You, she sings every evening at 10 p.m. India time and 7 p.m., 10.30 p.m. India time and 7 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And Neil's morning broadcast can be subscribed to on the Telegram channel, the link for which is on our chat box here, and actually on all our socials and all the website and everywhere. So join in, share it with people. Thank you again, Neil and Bindu, and good night. Good night, thank you. Good night, good night. Thank you so much. <laughs>